This is Bible Academy. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo. Today we continue in the book of Romans, chapter 11. But before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and that we are controlled with the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this privilege and opportunity that we have to study your word. We ask now that we'll have open hearts and minds to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go back and look at where the warning began for the Gentiles not to get a superior attitude towards the Jews or the Israelites. Verse 17, Romans 11, 17. Now if some of the branches were broken off, and you, a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among them, and shared of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, Branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Rightly so, they were broken off for their unbelief, but you stand by your faith. Do not think yourself superior to them, but fear. Now before we leave these two verses, and actually the the same principle that I'm going to point out continues on in the next couple of verses. I want you to see that this is written to individual Gentiles. <clears throat> Let's look at verse 19 and 20 again. As we see all these uh, singular uh, persons. Uh, you, second person, singular. I, first person, singular. You again, yourself. And then the verb in the second person, singular. In other words, this is a stern warning to each and every Gentile believer that there's a real potential for them to be broken off as individuals if they do not stand by one's faith, if one does not stand by his faith. Verse 21 continues. It gives further explanation why they should fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. If God would judge the natural branches, so he would judge those grafted in who began to lose their faith. This warning is not to be taken lightly. Now some might wonder, why would Paul give this warning? Is there a real danger of Gentiles, individual Gentiles, falling away from the faith? Of course. And since this is towards individuals, then individual believer Gentiles should realize there's a real danger of falling into unbelief. In verse 22, we see the actions of God toward each group, that is, those who believe and those who do not. Behold, therefore, the kindness and severity of God. To those who fell, severity, but to you, God's kindness. If you should remain in his kindness, Otherwise, you also will be cut off. Again, singulars. The first line, Behold, therefore, the kindness and severity of God. That gives us the two penalties. Excuse me, the two different possibilities. One's a penalty, that's severity. And these, either blessings or penalty, depends upon one's individual faith. To those who fell, severity. The word also means harshness. It basically means to be cut off. It means a severe penalty. That's the idea behind it. But to you, 
those who are standing by faith, God's kindness. But look at the condition. If you should remain in his kindness. The second person singular present active subjunctive with the conditional word aeon. Third class condition. More probable future. The idea is that you probably will remain, but there's still the possibility that it may not happen. That's why we put in the word should. There's a possibility of not remaining in that condition. The thing to remain in is God's kindness. The word means his beneficial goodness. The alternative, otherwise, you also will be cut off. This is a stern warning to Gentile believers, each and every one of them, that they could be cut off. The word for cut off, let's get it up here, et copto, it does mean to be cut off, Second person singular, future passive indicative. You could be cut off. That's the idea behind it. A couple of principles here. Paul does not say the Gentiles as a group will be cut off, but he's speaking to individual believer Gentiles, warning them to remain in God's kindness. Stay in the position. Hold your ground. You do that by faith. Just as you got into it, that's how you keep it. The second point, they are warned not to become like so many did in Israel who were cut off because of unbelief. And that takes you back to verse 20. It's a standard teaching of Paul that believers must continue in their faith to receive eternal life and the blessings that come with it. Let me give you three short passages. Colossians 1, 22 and 23. Yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach, if indeed you continue in the faith. Firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which is proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. There we see, if indeed you continue in the faith. Hebrews 3.6 Yeah, let me get two Hebrews passages together here. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are, if we hold our, if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. There is a warning to believers collectively. You have to hold your ground. If I was to say, uh, if, if there was a half a dozen people in front of me and I says, you need to hold your ground. Well, I'm speaking to you collectively, but it means also each and every one of you. Hebrews 3.14, but we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. Our verse again, Romans 11.22. Then we'll look at some principles. Notice or behold, I have translated it behold, I have noticed still here in this one translation, but I went back to behold. Behold, therefore, the kindness and severity of God to those who fail severity, but to you, God's kindness, if you should remain in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. Now, from what we have seen in this passage, beginning with the analogy to the olive tree, and its branches. Let's look at some principles. See if I can put these all up on the board at one time. One, branches were broken off because of their unbelief. 
as individual Jews refused to, spawn, to respond to God, though they were from his select nation, they were broken off the tree. Now the indicator is that they were broken off in unbelief. You might put it this way. They went up there on the tree, ready to go, ready to believe. But because they died without faith, they were broken off. Two, this breaking off left room, or created room, for the grafting in of wild olive branches, Gentile believers. Three, the wild olive branches, Gentile believers, are warned not to think themselves superior to the Jews, but fear their own potential for failure and to unbelief. Four, neither natural or the unnatural wild branches are spared if there is unbelief. Five, the kindness or severity of God towards a branch as a result of the branch remaining in or not in God's kindness, the beneficial place of goodness. Six, if one does not maintain his faith in that kindness, a place of beneficial blessing, one is cut off from it, loses his place. 7. This clearly means there is a real possibility and danger of those who have taken the place of the Jews to fall away by unbelief. 8. Finally, if this were not the correct interpretation, there would be no point to the warning. In verse 23, Paul continues the metaphor, going back to the Jews currently in unbelief. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. Now he's speaking to them as the Jewish people. If they decide as individuals in the Jewish community, uh, the ethnic Jews, if they decide to believe, they can be grafted back in. God is able to graft them back in, even as the Jewish community. Now, if we try to keep the strict practices of grafting in here, this, some of this analogy is not going to make completely, uh, complete good sense. Uh, you don't normally graft in a natural branch. Uh, that stays in the tree. When Paul uses these analogies, we can't be real strict, as I said. He simply means that if the Jews choose to turn back to God in faith, then God can put them back into being God's people. Verse 24 furthers the point of the natural branches being grafted back in. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will they, these who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? I guess the best thing we can take off of this is that but you normally wouldn't take a natural branch off, cut it off, and graft it back in. You just leave it there. The idea is that they're just as qualified to come back in, too. Uh, they would probably even take to it better if one was to push the point here. But again, these analogies from plants and stuff have their limitations. But let's look at this a little bit more. But if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree that would be an example Gentile turn believers and were grafted uh, were grafted uh, con let me see by nature wild olive tree, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree all right how much more will these who are the natural branches 
be grafted into their own olive tree. How much more would they do better? All right. So this would be the Israelites turning believers, coming back in to the fold, you might say. Now this prepares us for the remainder of the chapter. So let's draw some conclusions from the olive tree analogy. Let's see if I can get up on the board for you again. The tree represents Israel, rooted in Israel's past of faith and the patriarchs. Two, the natural branches would be those of Israel's stock who maintained their faith. Three, the broken off branches are those of Israel's Jews who die without faith in Christ. Four, the grafted in branches from the olive tree are Gentiles turned believers who become part of the tree. Five, though they become part of the tree, they are still wild olive branches or Gentile believers and not Jews. Both groups maintain their distinctions throughout the analogy. Six, though the numbers of Gentiles do replace the branches broken off, they never become the natural branches. Seven, Neither do the Gentile branches replace the tree rooted in Israel. It doesn't become a wild olive tree. 8. In effect, the tree is now made of two peoples and together, in the analogy, there are the people of God. We have to be careful how we use our terms here. Let me see if I can just give you an idea of what's going on out there in the evangelical conservative world on this particular subject. You have the nation of Israel. Clearly, Old Testament subject. And you have Gentiles. There's basically two extremes on this. There are some who say that there's such a a big separation between these two groups that the Gentiles basically are just the church. Oh, you can throw some Jews in there, but still predominantly the Gentiles. And that ties in well with the pre-trib rapture. This is the church, or what they would call the Bride of Christ. They're raptured out, leaving only Israel left for the seven-year tribulation. I point out this to you because this often is one package. So one group wants to have this big divide. The other group is kind of the other extreme. Is basically they say, let me get a new chart here. They say basically the Gentile church replaces Israel. Both views are wrong. Both views are an extreme. The tree is a great illustration if you stay with it. They never lose their distinction. You always have Gentiles and you always have Israel. They both keep their distinctions as believers. But when it comes to the church, let's get another piece of paper. It's made up of Jewish and Gentile believers. That's the whole thing. Let's look at some terms here just to help us keep these things sorted out. Let's define them in the way we've been looking at them in our passage. Now I'm talking about our passage. Israel. We've seen it as the nation. It's a nation of Jews. Uh, you can say ethnic Jews, racial Jews. It's the race of Israel. There's true Israel. That's actually a... A, a, a term that I used 
and translating chapter 9, verse 6, when referring to the phrase, all Israel is not true Israel. I threw the true in there just to make this distinction. All Israel, of course, was this one up here. The true Israel in that particular use was believers. There's also the terms Israel of God. There's only one place in Scripture, and that's Galatians 6.16, and that's a reference to all believers. But that does not mean the Gentiles are Israel. That's going to one of those extremes, or takes over Israel. All right? You also have the New Covenant Church. Now listen carefully to this one because I don't want you to get it confused. The New Covenant Church, again, that's my terms. You won't find a phrase in the Bible called the New Covenant Church. You'll find church, you'll find New Covenant, but not used together. But basically what this is, is when the New Covenant comes into effect in Acts chapter 2, at least that's one stage of it, all right? It's actually based upon the work of Christ on the cross, uh, who you might say in Christ inaugurated it, to use that term, at the Lord's Supper. When the Spirit came is when it really kicked off in Acts 2. There you had a combination of Jewish believers for some time, and then they started adding Gentiles. I pointed out that story regarding Cornelius, Cornelius and Peter uh, in Acts 10. But basically, all I'm doing here is saying, that's the New Covenant Church. That's what's going on right now, combined of Jewish and Gentile believers. Now, this is to distinguish it from, we could call the Old Covenant Church, but then I don't use that phrase. But what we're saying here is, this is to distinguish it from the church today, from all past believers before the New Covenant began. So then that brings us to the next term, church. The church, the term is actually used in the Old Testament also for believers. So it would actually carry on from Adam up till uh, the very last believer at this point. That's God's people. Which brings us to the next term, let's go to the people of God. This is one we're fairly safe with here. Uh, it is the same as the church, all believers. Now, here's where you got to be careful also. There's also such phrases as God's people. Some people you will use that for Israel or God's chosen people. Well, in the Old Testament, that's used for Israel as a nation, as an ethnic group. But then again, when you get to the New Testament, with Peter, he calls us chosen. He calls believers chosen. So this was a little confusing. You just have to know the context and what you're reading. Now let's look at a few things that Jewish and Gentile believers have in common. I did go through those pretty fast, didn't I? Uh, these are some things that both Jewish and Gentile believers have in common. Let's put it this way. Jewish and Gentile believers. This goes for both. They are all attached to the cornerstone. We saw that in Romans. It's also in Ephesians 2, 19 and 20. Ephesians 2, 19 and 20. They're all now in, in Christ, or what we call union with Christ, abbreviated this way. They're a union with Christ, Galatians 3, 28. Jew and Gentile believers are also all now members of the body of Christ.
Ephesians 3, 6. Both are the people of God. Uh, several verses for that. Romans 9, 25 through 26. Particularly Hebrews 4, 9. 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10. Hebrews 4, 9. 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10. And they are all Abraham's spiritual seed. Galatians 3.29 Beginning in verses 25, going through verse 22, Paul discusses the comeback of Israel. By that I mean Israel as a people, as an ethnic group, as a race, coming back to God. The key term in this passage is the term mystery. Now, a moment ago, I showed you some of the views regarding the relationship between the Gentiles and the Jews. Well, this topic, the mystery, will show you what the Bible says about it. Keeping in mind what we've learned from the analogy of the tree, this carries over clearly into the teaching of the mystery that Paul begins to show us here in these verses. In fact, these verses, 25 through 32, are basically the, the heart of all three chapters, 9 through 11. This is what we've been wanting to get to. Uh, we call this the climax of the chapter, of the chapters. Now, when Paul starts to teach this, he's going to restate some of the principles regarding Israel we've covered before. So we should, at the same time, be getting these facts set in our memory, uh, refining them in our thinking on this critical subject. Uh, let me just give you a couple examples of where this can get carried away if one does not understand this. If you think the Gentiles have completely taken over Israel, then you would also think, well, then what future does Israel have? That could also uh, come with other thinking like, well, there's no purpose for Israel. Or Israel was done away with by God. And there actually, as many are today, and don't misunderstand me, there are most Israelites that we've just learned are hardened toward God. They're not pro-Christian. Politically, some are, because they know that's the way the United States often goes, and they want our support. But if one carries this idea too far that the Gentiles are only ones that are left, then that could lead to some anti-Semitism. Why is Israel taking advantage of us? You see, uh, we owe them nothing. They, they are really nothing anymore in God's sight. So... One has to be careful of the extremes one can go if one doesn't have a properly, proper understanding of this. And this is probably what's led to a lot of anti-Semitism, even from Christians over the centuries. They didn't properly understand. Some blamed the Jews for killing Christ. Well, the Jews were involved in it, but so were the Gentiles. Who do you think the Romans were? So everybody was involved, so to speak, when it came to the crucifixion. So this is why it's so important to understand the mystery that Paul is about to reveal. Now we've already learned that some of this was already revealed in the Old Testament. It wasn't always completely understood, but it certainly pointed forward to the possibility of the Gentiles coming in to be the people of God. We saw those passages from the prophets. Now in verse 25, Paul opens up the principle I just got through saying, and I'm not trying to be... Uh, too harsh on this, but this is an important thing, people. I really, we really need to understand this for a number of reasons. There is so much error, 
surrounding the misunderstanding of what we're about to talk about in the next couple of lessons that Paul even warns people. Listen to verse 25, the beginning of it. I'll read the whole thing. For I do not want you, brethren, to be ignorant of this mystery, so that you may not be wise in your own eyes. A partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now I will say this is a fascinating uh, passage, verses 25 and 26 especially. Let's look at them a little bit at a time. He begins by saying, For I do not want you, brethren, to be ignorant of this mystery. Um, as I just got through saying in the introduction to this verse, this is something Paul wants his audience to know. And that's what I'm trying to relay to you. We need to know this. This will, If you don't know this, there's so many ways you can get into uh, the wrong uh, type of teaching. And what are we not supposed to be ignorant of? This mystery. Now sometimes I like a good mystery. I don't know about you. But this mystery is used a little bit different in the way the Greeks used it than the way Paul uses it. Similar. The uh, Greek word, let me show it to you. You can see where we got the word mystery from, but musterion, it means a secret, something hidden. Historically, it referred to the mystery rites of the ancient religions. You know, people uh, have even some of these things today and such things as the Masons. They have these mystery rites where you don't really know what they mean until you go up into the ranks. And then you're sworn not to tell anybody. Uh, I think some say that that's, uh, the penalty is death if you do. Well, that kind of nonsense has no place around Christians. Now, mystery. Theologically, for us, in our understanding, it usually refers to something hidden. You've seen me do these timelines. We did this referring to foreknowledge and predestination and so on. If this line represents uh, history, all of history, all right, let's say from Adam to uh, uh, eternity, okay, the end of the millennium, we'll just put it this way. We'll just call this history. A mystery is something back here. In eternity past, uh, we can do this a couple of ways. We can say it's in the mind of God. Something that the Trinity decided, the Godhead decided would occur. Sometime in the past. And it sometime call it the some people call it the Council of God. Alright? Uh, the decrees, these are things that they decreed would happen in the future. These mysteries, this is just basically the same thing, this big square box, it's revealed in history. It's uncovered. Paul is revealing one of those mysteries. Now, how do he get the mystery? It doesn't say specifically, but I would say it was two ways. From his own study of the Old Testament, and then through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, through his mind, working through his spirit. And God revealed to Paul this mystery. In fact, he's already touched upon some of the subjects of the mystery in Romans already. But right now, we're just trying to define the term mystery as we're using it in our context. It refers to something hidden in the counsel of God in eternity past, it remains unknown until the time for it to be revealed. It often relates to something at the end times. Now, back to our verse. Let me read the first part again and pick it up where we left off. For I do not want you, to, brethren, to be ignorant 
of this mystery. Then he tells why he doesn't want them to be ignorant of it. So that you may not be wise in your own eyes. Now that means to be conceited or arrogant about what you know. Some insight or wisdom that you think you've got the corner on truth somehow. This would be like taking one of those extremes I was talking about a few moments ago regarding the church in Israel. Or you think you have the answer and you're going to hold the fact that you're a Gentile superior to the Jews and you always will be. You're the bride of Christ. You're the body of Christ. You're super special. Paul's saying, let me, let me reveal to you a mystery so you won't be so arrogant about, about it. So one of the reasons Paul's revealing this mystery to them is so they will not ir get arrogant about themselves and think themselves something extra special. All it takes is a little misunderstanding of what is going on between the Gentiles and Israel, uh, like calling the church the Gentile church or the church and saying such things that the church didn't exist until Acts 2. Well, the problem with that is, when you look at the idea that what is behind the term church, it basically means God's people. It's just that there's been a difference in the way God administers it. At first, remember, it was through Gentiles. Adam up to Abraham. Abraham started out as a Gentile. And then it picked up being administered through the people of Israel and then the nation of Israel. And then the nation of Israel, it was administered through them. It was postponed with Christ on the cross. And then it was picked up from Israel and handed over to the new covenant church, which just included the remnant of Israel, believing Jews at that time, and carried forward with Jewish and Gentile believers. Which really brings us back, if you think of it, let's get a timeline up here. Maybe I should have drawn this out as I talked my way through it. But you have your Gentiles at first, Adam, right? Up to Abraham, Jews, the nation Israel, you just start that with Moses, but this basically consisted of Jewish people up to the cross. Then it picked up again with Jews and Gentiles. All believers, all the church. There's no reason to make these special distinctions. And the reason I pick out, I do use the phrase, New Covenant is to make sure everybody's reminded that we're under the New Covenant now. We're not under the Old Covenant. All right? We could say back here with Moses, the Old Covenant church started. But that's not even that important to make that distinction. Believers are believers. But at the same time, the distinction that God does keep is that there are Jewish believers and there are Gentile believers. Here he dealt with Gentiles a certain way. Over here he started with the Jews and Israel in a certain way. He's going to come back at the end. As you know about the tribulation and such things as that. He's going to come back at the end. And he's going to deal with Israel again at the uh, beginning of the tribulation. Israel is going to be the main they're going to be center stage again as I like to put it they're going to be center stage again Gentiles will certainly be involved just that Israel will come to the front right now they're kind of in the back seat during the tribulation they'll come to the front seat especially when you have people like Moses and Elijah stand out 144,000 all right and the centerpiece area will be Israel. 
the Antichrist doesn't set up his kingdom in Washington, D.C., or London, or Paris, or Brussels. Of course, he may have had big headquarters there, but the main place that he wants, he wants his throne in Jerusalem. So, back to the point. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Make sure you understand this mystery, Gentiles. Paul is countering that type of thinking by revealing this mystery, hoping the Gentiles will have a better understanding of their position in relation to Israel. Now, our next phrase in our verse begins to explain the mystery. Paul will give two parts of it. And these first two we are familiar with already. One, partial hardening. Partial hardening has happened to Israel. Now we know what this means already. Right? We've already got this understood. We went through it. Uh, that means those who are not hardened, we have what? We have a remnant. Right? We have the remnant. So the remnant's the believers. Up here's the majority are being hardened. The small minority are, are, are make up the remnant. The second point we learned about this that Paul's also mentioning, he mentions the phrase, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Important phrase. But this implies that until takes it up to a point in time. Second point of the mystery is that it's temporal. The hardening, hardening is temporal. All right, let's put it over here, temporal hardening. And then we see the word until in our verse. Let's just look at our verse again towards the end. A partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now, if you can just read plain English, it's simple to understand. This partial hardening has a end point. That end point is when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. The word for until, it's a preposition, arche, or excuse me, acri, up to a point of time, or up to a place, or when conditions occur. Basically, it's the same way we use it today. He will run until he can't breathe anymore. All right? He will climb until he can't go any further. He spent everything he could until he ran out of money. All right? They had class until time was up. Okay? Here, the point of termination is the fullness of the Gentiles. The fullness of the Gentiles. <clears throat> what is the fullness of the Gentiles? The word fullness is used here in the sense of numbers. When the final numerical complement of Gentiles come into the people of God. The fullness of the Gentiles is when the final numerical complement of Gentiles come into the people of God. Uh, think of it this way. Think of the branches of that tree that we talked about being completely full. 
when that is full of enough Gentiles, then there's going to be another shift. And what's going to happen is, and we're going to study this in detail in this passage, is that there's going to be another change of administration where Israel will come back to the center place again. Now this idea of fullness is similar to what we saw with Israel back in verse 12 when they, when we saw that their time finally comes in. And we'll tie those in together here as we proceed through this. There we saw the Gentiles will share in that blessing with them in the Millennial Kingdom. Let's see if I can get this on a timeline. <clears throat> Alright. Now, Let's be patient with me on this because I haven't I didn't plan on doing this, but I want to I think it'll help us some little bit. All right. Uh, let's just go back to the time of Israel, okay? Taking us up to the cross. Then it opens up to what I've called the New Covenant Church. All right. New Covenant Church, where you have both Jew and Gentile together. This continues on. The tree is being filled up right now with mostly Gentiles, okay? Let's just put G's down here, okay? A few Jews, all right? There will come a point when this will change again. And it'll go back to Jew, 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 Gentile, Gentile, Gentile. When does this happen? Do you know? The millennium. Our Lord Himself spoke about the fullness of the Gentiles. He referred to it in another phrase called the times of the Gentiles. That refers to basically the same thing. One emphasizes one thing over the other. Let's look at Luke 21 22 for a moment. For this is the time of punishment and fulfillment of all that has been written. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. There will be a great distress in the land and wrath against the people. They will fall by their sword and they will be taken as prisoners to all the nations. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now tell me. When is the time of Gentiles fulfilled? Well, let's get another timeline up here. We're going to run it parallel with this one. Let's get the cross here again. There's Israel. Israel. Here's the New Covenant Church. Going along, going along, going along. Let's move this down, down here a little bit. This is second advent and the millennium starts, okay? When is the time of Gentiles fulfilled? Well, Jesus just described there will be a time of great distress in the land and wrath against the people. When does that occur? Through the tribulation. Particularly the last half. All right, let me read this to you. They will fall by the sword, and they will be taken as prisoners to all the nations. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles to the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. The times of the Gentiles end right here, which is the same as right here, beginning of the millennium. The phrase, the fullness of the Gentiles, like we have in our passage, emphasizes the numbers of Gentile believers filling the ranks of the New Covenant Church up to the return of Christ. That's a Christian thing. All right? 
emphasizes the numbers of Gentiles, uh, believers, filling the ranks of the New Covenant Church, or the Church, up to the return of Christ. The times of the Gentiles, that's more of an unbeliever term, though we understand it as believers, and unbelievers wouldn't understand what it meant, but Basically, that's referring to the time when the Gentiles are dominating. Uh, they are taking center stage instead of Israel. Israel takes a back seat. So, the fullness is the numbers of Gentiles filling the church ranks. When those numbers are complete, Christ is going to return. At the same time, you have the times of the Gentiles ending, and then Israel will come back on center stage. Now, a major point of the mystery that was hidden, but now is revealed during the time in the writings of Paul is this. The Gentiles are coming in large numbers during this period of temporary and partial, partial hardening of Israel. Then once the number is complete, Israel takes center stage again at the millennial reign when Christ begins to rule on earth again. Okay. Well, we're going to continue with verse 26 next time where we look at the third point of the mystery and a more precise time of when it will happen. Let's pray. Well, Father, we thank you again for this privilege we've had to study your word as these things become so important to us, especially as we near the time of the tribulation and then the return of Christ. We ask that we'll have these fixed in our minds, that we will not be ignorant of the mystery, but know it very well so we can not only apply it, but we can be those bright stars that tell others that Jesus is coming. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.